So the stereotype goes, Germans love socks and sandals. They're not opposed to them, which in my book is enough to say that this is an issue. Expat Life Germany and it's episode 20. Oh my goodness, can you believe it? Episode, I've done 20 of these now. And thank you to everyone who's been there from the start and everyone who's joining now. Thank you to everyone who's listening. If you want to stay up to date with Expat Life Germany, join my mailing list. And you can get a monthly newsletter and I promise you, no spam. No spam. There's a link in the show notes where you can sign up for the newsletter. Do it and you'll get the latest news, as I said, every month. And another thing, if you have a story to tell about Germany, go to expertlifegermany.de and click on the Be On The Show link. I'm always looking for new guests and topics to talk about. So, with all of that out of the way, for episode 20, I got a good one for you. I'm very excited about today's episode because I have my podcast rival. It is Nicole Palazzo from the Expat Cast. She's from USA and she also hosts an expat podcast. She's based in Germany and she also talks to a lot of expats in Germany, but she also includes expats outside of Germany and all over the world. So to take a listen to her podcast. In a recent episode called My Expat Story, Nicole told her expat story, as the title suggests, and gave an introduction to her life as an expat in Germany. Now, I thought, seeing as though she's already done that... I would do something different with her as a guest on my show. So what we are doing, we talk about German stereotypes and cliches, and we try to confirm or bust them. So that is what is coming up in this episode. And of course, we take the liberty of talking in great sweeping generalizations about Germans and an entire culture. So take it with a grain of salt. It's just our observations. And of course, we don't think all Germans are like this. Just... General observations, you know? Things are never that cut and dried in reality, but there might just be some truth here and there, is all I'm saying. Nicole has a very unique and amusing view of life, and I find that she's very observant. So I hope you enjoy the insights into German culture as seen by outsiders, specifically outsider podcasters. Here we go. So this week's guest is... My sworn rival, the host of another expat podcast in Germany. It's called The Expat Cast, and her name is Nicole Palazzo, and she's from the United States. Welcome to the show, Nicole. Thank you very much. Now, before we start, can you give me a really quick overview uh, of where you're from and why you're in Germany? I, as you said, I'm from the U.S. I grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia, um, Pennsylvania, which used to be the capital of the United States, but no one in Germany knows that. They only know it if I sing the Philadelphia cream cheese theme song. So I'm from <laughs> Philadelphia. <laughs> um, right, there you go. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then I lived a couple places in the U.S. before moving to um, Freiburg, Germany about two years ago. Okay, so Nicole, I thought since you've been in Germany for long enough now to understand more of the culture and you live with a German, you might be a perfect candidate for something I've been wanting to do on the show, and that is to go through some of the common cultural stereotypes and myths about Germans. And I was thinking we could do a kind of a Mythbusters thing. Here's what I'm thinking. We, we go through some, some stereotypes that, uh, that I've seen pop up regularly in YouTube videos or in blog posts or that you've heard of. And then we're, we're, um, we're going to try and confirm the stereotypes as being true or we're going to bust the stereotype. Sounds so, good. And you, you've got some prepared. I got some prepared. So uh, let's see what we got. Okay. So, of course, before we, before we do this, we've got we to put out a caveat that these are generalizations, of course. For sure. But, yeah. yeah. And, yeah, I'm only two years in and I've only lived in – one little corner of Germany. And I've also not even traveled very far within Germany. So I definitely take mine with a grain of salt. I might just be talking about Southern Germans. Yeah. So th there are your caveats, folks. So I'll, I'll kick us off. I'll kick us off with one of them that I, that I think people associate with Germany the most is the fact that Germans are supposed to be very efficient. So what, what do you think, Nicole? Germans are efficient, are they? I think in a way that they are. Yeah, I think a lot of ways they are. One of the reasons that I was a little hesitant to be like, no, it's totally true is because their decision making process is sometimes very lengthy in a way that I find inefficient. 
But I also suppose in the long run, what they're trying to do, like their their approach to decision making is to talk about every possible way that it could turn good or bad. And what would you do in that scenario? And in and that process then takes so long that to me, I'm sitting there like, oh, my God, let's just do something. This is really inefficient. But at the end of the day, maybe it does prepare you more for the what ifs. And then you don't, you don't have to invest as much time in the future when those things happen because you're prepared and you can just do the thing. Um, but that's really the only example that came to my mind where I was like, oh, that's super inefficient. A lot of the other ways they are very efficient, like the grocery store line, of course. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. For me, that, that's a lot of what I was thinking of from my perspective as well. I think Germans are very efficient. They they definitely have, I think it comes also down to all, all their rules that they have. It's kind of, some of it is to make them more efficient as well. It's just everything is geared towards not wasting any time. But some so sometimes I find this quite difficult as well uh, because sometimes I think that they're way too efficient. But yeah, I would say that... Um, it's it's uh, confirmed from my side. So that's a confirmed from you as well. Definitely. Oh, another example of though how it might not be confirmed is bureaucracy. However, I would argue that all bureaucracy is inefficient. So Yeah, that's that's actually a very good point. That is for such an efficient culture, the the bureaucracy is quite surprising because there is a lot of extra fat around those processes that yeah, maybe right. don't need to be there or things and also things that they could have cleaned up years ago you could you, you think wow we're still doing this paper based and we're not doing this electronically yet or, or something like that so i guess i think you're right there i think the bureaucracy might indicate that it's not confirmed <laughs> hmm. mostly confirmed okay so we, we can we can hit the the germans are very efficient as mostly confirmed i'm, I'm happy with that <laughs> all right cool i'll hit us with the next one <laughs> yeah they are said to be very punctual what do you think yeah <laughs> just straight up yeah <laughs> um i think so i think that they're, they're they do value time i come from south africa and their time is a little more relaxed so if you invite someone to a party you don't expect to see them at the time that you invite them really which is <laughs> kind of strange <laughs> but it is it definitely is weird that um they they do they they show up exactly on the time that they're supposed to show up, but it's obviously not in all situations. I would say in a workplace they're very punctual, but I've also noticed that it varies. It varies from social situation and and so on. But but mostly yes, that's a yes from me. What do you, what are your thoughts? I think especially as a foreigner, I find them exceptionally punctual. I think in their own eyes, sometimes they're like, oh no, we're not, and they'll talk about you know delayed buses or trains. But to me, even those delayed buses and trains are still pretty punctual. Like I was recently in Italy and the train showed up like 12 minutes late without any announcement or anything. They just were like, hey, it's close enough to on time. Whereas in Germany, if it's three <laughs> minutes late, there's an announcement and everyone's really upset that it's running late. But that yeah. just shows me like their standards are just so much higher than my own. <laughs> so I definitely think they are yes. very punctual. Yes, that is that is true, and I th um, the the uh, the uh, example with the trains as well. But I think the stereotype about Germany is that the trains run on time. That is not true, uh, just as a general thing. But the expectation that the Germans have, exactly like I say, when it's three minutes later, everyone's freaking out and going, "Where is this train? Where is this train?" And they're making announcements, <laughs> and yeah, so it's a good it's a good point. <laughs> All right, so that's confirmed. Pun Germans are punctual. Yes. So there seems to be something to these stereotypes. <laughs> <laughs> <It's cliche. laughs> All right. I, my next one is Germans don't have a sense of humor. Is this true? Doch. 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 I think they do. It's just very strange and specific. And you <laughs> kind of have to be pretty fluent in German to get it a lot of the times. I don't even know how I would yeah. describe the humor, though. Um, some of them do have pretty dark humor. They don't really have the sense of humor that I'm used to of like irony and sarcasm. But but they have their own way that goes in that direction. I don't know how to yes. how to describe it very well, though. What do you think? Exactly. I think you're describing it very well because that's also very much my opinion of Germans' sense of humor. You said that their their humor can be very dark. That is very much something that I found. They they have a very irreverent sense of humor, and quite often they also enjoy not being politically correct when they're being funny. Yeah. So it's, it's it can be very dark and it's very irreverent, irreverent. And I actually like it a lot. But <laughs> I agree 100% with what you say as well. It's a bit different to what I'm used to also in very similar way that you mentioned because I also, oh. I, I love self-deprecating humor. 
I don't know why. It's just, you know, I think, but I think that's something that we South Africans do. And I know that Americans and uh, British people do it quite a lot as well. And uh, yeah, sarcasm and irony. I often make a, a sarcastic comment and Germans will completely overanalyze that comment. And I was like, guys, that was a joke. And they'd be like, why would you say that though? I wish I could think of a good example of when this happened, but that's, that's pretty much, well, that's pretty much my experience of it. So I've been doing this a lot recently where, you know, at work, um, something will go wrong, a computer's broken, and there's a giant line and five people are calling on the phone. And my coworker turns to me and it's like, oh, this is a situation. Oh, geez. And um, I go, oh, great. Super. <laughs> and to me, it's just kind of like, oh, super. It's super sarcastic. It's a way of like forcing optimism almost, but not really. And they always look at me like, oh, but it's, but it's not super. Did you not hear? There's the computer's broken and people are calling on the phone. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I get it. I, I get that it's not super. It's never mind. I don't even know how I could explain why I think it's just funny to it. say that it's super because it doesn't, you know, it's just a cultural thing, I think. Um, so I couldn't really back up my joke, yeah. but, but that kind of thing doesn't work with them. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the political correctness thing, or in their case, political incorrectness, because one time I was with a German rugby team at the pub and um, they were, you know, having drinks and maybe making some offhanded comments that were politically incorrect. And a friend of mine who was also there is very strongly liberal and really, um, you know, d d doesn't like to, to stand up for even anyone in the, in the vicinity saying something that she would say is, is um, flawed morally. And so she, to me, I was like, I understand that this level of humor that they don't actually really mean it. It's just to them funny somehow. Um, but she's yeah. not fluent in German. And so the miscommunication was just spiraling. And then it became this whole conversation about well, all sorts of social topics like feminism and racism and all this stuff. And, these, you know, at a, at a pub of all places, it just it just. I was watching this culture clash play out in front of me and I didn't know how to explain to either side, like why for her as she's also American, um, this form of humor is really uncomfortable and why for them it was yeah. sort of normal and okay. Um, though I guess you could, I don't know, I guess you, you could debate if that's okay or not. But I, I think to me, I'm like, they're different social contexts and I think it's both are valid. Um, but they were just, were not, they just clash, just grew and grew. Yeah. <laughs> I think what often happens with their, what might seem as political incorrectness is that they're actually making a comment about the thing that they're making a joke about. And it comes across as political, politically incorrect, but actually there's a layer behind it that they're trying to get at as to say, look, this is a real issue. So by me taking the part of someone who has been this political incorrectness, it's kind of like they're playing on a different, uh, on, on two different levels there, I think. Or maybe we're just giving them way too much latitude when it comes to that. <laughs> but I, I kind of get it. I don't... I will say their, their type of humor doesn't lend itself super well to stand-up comedy. <laughs> no, 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 no. I've tried, I don't know if you've ever seen when it's fashing time and fashing time in Germany is the, the carnival time. They have a whole spate of stand-up comedians and uh, comedy. And I use that word very, very loosely uh, specials on TV that you can tune in and watch. And it is terrible. It is just, I, I'm sorry, Germany. And I'm sorry, Germans that might love that stuff. It is horrible. <laughs> well but then they love like so much physical comedy and yes. they're obsessed with what is it dinner for one yes. which is kind of funny in its own way but not to the extent that they think <laughs> seem to think it is they think it is hilarious and they quote it which is one of the strangest things i found about moving to germany is they're, they're quoting for those who don't know dinner for one is a, i guess how how old 50s 60s maybe even older gosh something like that yeah, yeah. it is an it is a 50s let's say that era black and white comedy sketch that lasts about 20 minutes of a woman and her butler and her butler takes the part of her deceased friends and she celebrates New Year's Eve every year. The Germans love this and they show it every New Year's Eve in Germany. So that was something that very much surprised me and they quote it anytime. So anytime someone says like, same procedure as uh, <laughs> the last time and same procedures every year. So I'm like, yep. what? And the, the boot, I don't think you mentioned this. It's British. It's, yes, it's, it's British. They play, it, they play it in English. They do not dub it anything. <laughs> it's, it's like bizarre. the only thing on TV that's not dubbed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, it's a thing of beauty. So um, yeah. I guess what we were saying about this one, Nicole, is Germans do have a sense of humor. It's just maybe not um, 
not like we're used to. I think you summed it up pretty well at the beginning. So this one is busted. Yeah. Busted. <laughs> the next one I had is that they're very direct. Yes. I think that is just a straight up confirm for me. They are very direct. They are they have a way of saying things that you would never as a South African in my culture, you would never say to someone else without a lot of preparation or whatever. So if there's something that's going on, <laughs> they will be very straightforward and tell you exactly their opinion about it. And uh, yeah, I, I that's a confirm for me. What do, what do you what do you think, Nicole? I also want to say straight up confirmed, though I do, I have observed that there are some lower level issues that haven't quite elevated themselves to a thing where they think they should address it, where they can be a little bit not passive aggressive quite, but but a little they'll still stay say things directly, but the words they're saying are getting at the issue indirectly. Right. Where they'll say something like, um, oh geez, I don't know, like, <laughs> oh, do you not like this food? Because you're not eating that much of it. And and that's like a weird question. What they actually really want is to you to compliment their food. But instead of, you know, asking for something like that, so upfront, they would say more in this sort of, it's still pretty aggressive. It's still pretty um, upfront, you know, but it's a little bit more indirect slash direct, if that yes. makes any sense. I, 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 I have also experienced that where they will ask a question that is, like you say, getting at a, another issue and not actually coming out and saying it. And uh, yeah, so there, there's two sides to that then is what you're saying. We, we have the direct thing where they'll tell you you've got something stuck between your teeth or they'll tell you that, yeah. the, way that the way that you did something was not f good. But then there's another one where they've got a point that they want to make and they won't be direct about it, but they will ask you kind of all kinds of questions around the issue uh, to kind of broach the issue. Right. And I think to me, I still want to say I confirm this one because that to me is a form of being direct, right? They're still yeah. speaking to the issue and in a prompt manner. They're not letting it stew. Like I think this happens to me at work a lot in the workplace and in America in the workplace, if there's a conflict, a lot of people don't say a single thing um, or they say something super passive aggressive or in a social setting and they let it build for months and then it comes out later that it's this huge issue. And they're not doing that. They're, they're taking on the issue, but they're, I think, trying to maybe soften or ease themselves into it in a way that does come across as somewhat indirect. But for me, I still would consider that the overall approach direct. Yeah, I agree. And the thing about Germans as well is that they are, they don't have a problem with confrontations, the, the, which which sometimes for me makes me squeamish because I also come from, I guess South Africans are also very non-confrontational, generally, again, very much generalizations. And the Germans don't have, if there's something going on at the workplace or if they feel someone's not performing according to the way that they feel they should be for performing, they have no problems calling that person into a room and maybe calling some other related people to the issue into the room to discuss it, which is, like you say, I guess guess that's a good thing to get everything out in the open um but it's also very confrontational sometimes and i just i would like oh my god can we, can we not do yeah. this can we just pretend everything's okay <laughs> <laughs> i know exactly what you mean <laughs> yeah okay so so we got it we got it confirmed we, they, they are direct and they're direct in different ways yes all right another one that i have is germans love order so what do you think i think they like to have a plan and they like to know what's coming their way. I think they're not mm -hmm. necessarily the most spontaneous people unless you have planned to be spontaneous, um, which is a <laughs> thing that they do. <laughs> yes. um, so I think in that sense of order, yes. I think physically, if they're organized with their items, is really person to person. And they're pretty forgiving generally about different people's organization systems. Like if I have a really messy desk, I don't think I'm going to get too much crap for it as long as I know where everything is, what I need it. So, but I think in this more sort of philosophical approach to life, they are, they, they do need a, a bit of order. I agree. I think, and I think this is also where the bureaucracy comes from in some way, in some ways it's kind of their, their love for rules and orders and so on all around. They, they do love the rules. And I love what you said about them not liking to be not, not, you know, having to plan to be spontaneous, because that's also something that came up in some interviews that I did with some guests. Uh, one was saying that to become a friend, you almost had to be, you have to plan, you know, you can't just say, Hey, let's go for drinks tonight at, uh, at five o'clock. Are you free for drinks tonight? Or are you free for drinks this tomorrow? You kind of have to plan ahead with them. And, and so I guess that's also part of 
that uh, love for order. Right. And, and if you want to say, oh, where should we go for these drinks? So I feel like it would be a very German thing for them to ask. Um, oh, we're going to meet up for drinks in a week and a half. Where will we go? Right. They want to yes. know this information right at the yeah. get go. But if you say, oh, I don't really know yet. I kind of want to see how the weather is. And then we can decide that could be OK. That could yeah. be like, OK, we will be spontaneous. <laughs> yes. All right. We need <laughs> but to it planning, needs to be an explicit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. So they do love order. We're saying they love order. Confirmed. They sure do. Confirmed. Next. OK, what you got, Nicole? Next question is, do they also love bread and beer as much as everyone thinks that they do? <laughs> um, it's difficult for me to say in this case because I live in Bavaria and the, the answer in Bavaria where I live is very much yes. They do love bread. They can have <laughs> bread three times a day and they can have, I think if they were allowed to have bread, uh, beer all the time uh, during the day, they would. And in fact, when we first moved here, my wife's company had beer automaton. So kind of uh, <gasps> beer auto, auto, what do you call those thing, machines? Like auto, uh, vending automats? machines. Vending machines. Thank you, Nicole, for helping me with my native tongue. Uh, the vending <laughs> machines, they had beer in the vending machines at her offices. So this was in 2007. So that is well, not the case anymore, but I think they would still do it if they could. <laughs> so yeah, they love beer and they love bread as much as everyone thinks that they do. I would definitely also agree. I only live one state over in the south in Ben and but here it's also, yep, both things are very, very cherished. And actually, so I wrote these beside sitting beside my German boyfriend, and he said that growing up here, there was a rumor that, you know, there are certain goods that countries stockpile in case that there's some kind of emergency that they need access to um, supply and feed their people, right? So, you know, canned goods. Um, what have you. He said that growing up, they were told that the German government also stockpiles beer because it's considered this category of foods, this basic things that you need to survive. Beer. <laughs> <laughs> he yeah, said he has exactly. never fact checked it as an adult, but it's the kind of thing you grow up, like everyone talks about it. It's like a known thing. So that it. would be really interesting to hear if any of the listeners um, can confirm or deny that, or if they've also heard this or not. I would love to hear more about that. <laughs> Yeah, that would be a good thing to hear about. I've heard that it is, I think it's not text as an alcohol, it's text, text as a normal food stuff. But again, this is hearsay. These are, might be rumors that have been planted by the German <laughs> government to make us believe this stuff. Uh, uh, yeah, so it would be good to hear if anyone knows about that. But that's that's a confirm from both of us. Definitely. We can't speak for Northern Germany, but I guess we can uh, assume that it is. I think so. Right. Uh, this one's a big one, Nicole. This one's a really big one. So the stereotype goes, Germans love socks and sandals. <laughs> <sighs> so they're not opposed to them, which in my book is enough <laughs> to say that this is an issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. If you're not against it, you are for it. So exactly. sorry, this German. Is you know, I like to live in the gray in life, but honestly, I'm black and white about this. <laughs> and they are open to socks and sandals. So in my book, they love them and it's a problem. <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> yeah. What I found is that some do. Some some Germans definitely do love so socks and sandals. I've worked with countless people. I have even some friends in my circle of friends that uh, wear socks and sandals. And I've let them into my friend's circle anyway. Um, <laughs> but it's sometimes surprising that it's not just the uh, older Germans for me. Because I would have thought, okay, the older Germans love socks and sandals. But there, there are also younger Germans that uh, sort of embrace this. But my... My favorite thing that I've seen is when when expats start embracing this. It's kind of like they come here and they're, what are you doing with the socks and sandals? And I've seen some people after five years go, eh, you know what? And then they just join the craze. And I'm like, that is, un I don't even know what I'm I want to say. I, that is just un thinkable what you're Unreal, doing unacceptable yeah. <laughs> your visa is promptly revoked <laughs> yes yeah you're so out this of is a bad time to bad time to confess that i uh a couple weeks ago i bought my first pair of birkenstocks mm -hmm. i'm feeling very eingedeutscht mm -hmm. um i went to take my trash out i'd been wearing socks and sneakers that day mm -hmm. but i was just going to take the trash out i didn't want to lace up shoes so i just slid into my sandals went outside to the other side of the apartment building, dropped off my trash. Then I thought, hey, it's actually a really nice weather. Why don't I walk up the hill and take in um, some fresh air? 
And then all of a sudden, 30 minutes later, I looked down my feet and I'm like, <laughs> gosh darn it, it happened. Look, I was wearing that? socks and sandals and it it was terrible. It was terrible. I, I feel the need to confess it because I feel that's terrible about you. it. And I would not like this to be. Yeah, no. I don't want that's this how to they... be my future. I don't want this to be my truth. No, that's how they get you, Nicole. They get, that's how they get you. <laughs> the good news is it sounds like you're integrating well. <laughs> I think there, in my opinion, there is a certain level of integration that is admirable, and I do not want to go too far. That no. for me was a moment too far. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was I was all on board with your story when you were saying, yeah, I just popped out to go take the trash out because I when you said that I was like, mm, no, I've done that before. I've had socks on, and then I, there were only like sandals at the door, so I just put them on and I went outside. But when you then said right. that your day continued with them on, uh, I was like, okay, that's too far. <laughs> Sorry, Nicole, that's it. Um, it was, it was too far. No, it's okay. <laughs> Call me on it. And it's Keep good. me accountable. <laughs> it's, it's good that you just uh, admitted this on a podcast that's going to air and be there forever for people to hear. <sighs> anyway. I'm putting myself out there here today. Yeah. So German love socks and sandals. Yep. That's confirmed, confirmed, confirmed. <laughs> All right. So I've got a few more. Germans don't do small talk. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would agree. That's confirmed from Nicole. Oh, man. I don't think I'll. Oh, yeah. I don't think I can ever forget my first week at my first job in a German environment. We have, we have a coffee break every day, which is partially built in so that people see each other and chat because a lot of times everyone's sort of siloed in their office, in their department, doing their own thing. So this is like an opportunity to be more social. And we get up there and it was just silent. And of course, I'm paranoid being the new person, being the foreigner in the room that I somehow like caused this and that maybe it should be on me to like start create the conversation. My my American side was coming out real strong and I was like, oh no, silence, Ugh, can't handle it. Mm-hmm. So I, I turned to my colleague next to me and I said, so how are you doing so far today? And she was like, shrugged. It's Tuesday. It's 9.45. Uh-huh. That was it. And I was like, cool, great, okay. This is going well. <laughs> yep, making so many friends. <laughs> um, and I, I don't think, I mean, that's not always how these coffee breaks go. <laughs> but it is sometimes how they go. And um, And when we do have conversation, it's not, I don't know. It, there are people I am finding out now a year in that they have kids or partners you know I don't know anything about them we don't do small talk maybe maybe we can talk about the weather or something in the newspaper or something like this like more um impersonal things that are shared because we live in the same place those can be discussed but the small talk that I'm used to where you're just sort of chit-chatting sharing a little bit of personal information nothing too revealing just just a little just a little chit-chat that's not really a thing that I experience I will say you know in more informal environments, not at work, you know, out at a bar or something or hanging out with friends at a party, people are more likely to talk and it doesn't have to be about things that are very serious, which approaches small talk. <laughs> yeah, it's in, it's in that region. I think what you, the, the differenti- differentiation that you made with, uh, with, with people who I consider my friends, it's way easier to make something that's, that resembles small talk, I think. But there it's, even then it's more genuine. It's not just small talk. It's kind of like really asking how, how, are, how are the kids or how are your, how's work going or so on. So, yeah, I guess the only thing that they like to talk about is the weather, actually, <laughs> the Germans, they love to talk <laughs> about the weather, but generally the, they don't. Uh, have any problem with silence and i think i have the same problem as you nicole if there is a silence i have to fill it i cannot handle it. i've got actually it's kind of a disease of mine if there is a silence that's going on for five seconds already i start getting uncomfortable and if it reaches seven seconds i have to say something and invariably it's something completely irrelevant or mundane or stupid germans are quite happy to sit there in a in some kind of setting like in a before a meeting starts while you're waiting for everyone to arrive they're quite happy to just sit there and not say anything it's not right. always the case, but yeah, they, they can just sit in silence and it's no problem. So I guess the problem's with us. I do like it though. There are some moments where you can tell like they're trying, you know, especially I used to teach English or and or work in an institute where English was taught. And so some of the students would, they've heard about this thing called small talk in class. And so they would like to try it on for size. And so they try <laughs> to make, you know, try to make it happen. And, and it's kind of funny what they 
choose to say and how they how they are with their body language and all because it's like you are trying and the point of small talk is that you don't try and it's very casual yeah. and relaxed exactly but said, it's not really their thing the whole casual relaxed unplanned thing uh, okay so we have confirmed germans do not like small talk so then germans hate a draft or a breeze going through an office or in an apartment is this this is something that I've read, or, or I guess the Germans make this joke about themselves. Is this something that you you're aware of? It was not something I knew before moving to Germany. I would say this is a stereotype that they give themselves, and yes. it's super true. <laughs> it's super true. <laughs> yeah, they, it's so bizarre. They they need to luft all the time. They need to let fresh air yes. into the room, yes. so they open the window. But if that air becomes a draft, which I think you maybe have to be born and raised in Germany to know where the difference is. But if the air magically transforms itself from a fresh air breeze to a draft, then it's horrible and terrible and everyone should put on their um, scarves, shut the window and bring tea immediately lest they get a cold. So what? (laughs) Right away. (laughs) Exactly like you said, I am amazed that for for people who seem to go on a lot about drafts and say things like es zieht ein bisschen, which means basically that it's breezy in here, they are anal about airing out the apartments. And they will do it at when it's minus 10 degrees outside. They will open all the windows in the apartment. <laughs> and it, it, it's be, it'd be like si- the Siberian chill passing through the apartment. And you're like, what are you guys doing? You hate the breeze. So yeah, I find that very incongruous that they would hate draft so much and yet they have no issue airing out a room for 15 minutes and then having it be like a a refrigerator in there yeah so that's confirmed germans do hate a draft absolutely one of the this 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 is kind of a two-part one right so one of the things that i've gotten a lot on the show and i think that from what i've heard you've also discussed it with some of your guests before is that germans are difficult to make friends with is the stereotype and then the second part of this is that once you do make friends, you're in for life. So how, how close is this stereotype to truth? Uh, I think this is a really good question. And I feel like so many people do have different experiences with this. Like if you, you know, as a newcomer um, and as a foreigner are moving to Germany or living in Germany in a format where you have a connection already like if you're moving into the city where your partner already lives and has a network of friends then it's probably really easy to just become their friends meet their friends and become friends with the friends of the friends you know what I mean and and build a network from there I think that would probably be fine I don't think that that would be really that challenging at all but if you're coming in on your own, then I do think it's true. I mean, for me, I found that to be true. I, I think everyone meets each other at Fachrains, at, at clubs. And yeah. as someone who at the beginning didn't have money to join a club, and now I'm just looking around at all my interests, like, actually, these are things I like to do because I can do them alone. Um, I don't want to do them with other people. It's been hard to mm-hmm. find where I'm supposed to find these friends. It's not at the workplace. Yeah. Um, it's not you know, on the train or something, I'm not going to strike up a conversation with my seat partner. None of that would, would really be appropriate here. So I, I think it is in some ways hard to make friends with them at first. I guess, do we want to take on that first part? Do you want to respond to that part first? Yeah, that, I um, agree with you. I think that a, a lot of the problems come with how close the Germans seem to be. When we got here, we, we experienced the Germans being what we thought were unfriendly. And yet, they, at the same time, they were always helpful. So if they if we needed help, they were always there to help us, which was strange for me because in South Africa, one of the things is you kind of ask your friends for help. <laughs> you know, you don't exactly yeah. necessarily go and ask strangers for help. You ask the people that you're friends with. But here, when we moved in the beginning, people were very good at offering us help and getting us set up, but they weren't friends and they were sort of closed from a friendship perspective. So that was very surprising for me and very difficult to get my head around in the beginning. But yeah, I think... They're definitely difficult to make friends with. I've had people that I thought we would be friends because we have all the same tastes and everything. And it just never happened for some reason. (laughs) I don't don't know why. (laughs) But I think it's also, like you say, they're meeting people where they they meet them in the the clubs or uh, whatever hobbies that they're doing or in, in sport, you know, whatever that they're doing. And it's very difficult to get into those circles. I would say that part is confirmed. Not not with all Germans. I've also had Germans where it was from day one. 
I, I we were friends with and we're still friends now, like over a decade later. So that's there is an exception to that. It's not, obviously not all Germans, as we said up at the top, but uh, it's definitely on in general difficult to make friends with German. Right, and then in terms of once you make that friend, you have them for life. Um, I feel like in a strange way, yes. I mean, I have pretty limited experience with German friends. I would say I have a lot of German acquaintances. I know people who have German friends and I have hung out with them in joint settings multiple times, but we've never taken that next step to become friends ourselves. So I don't really hold them to any kind of standard, but the couple of German friends that I have made where I would have considered them friends. And I think this being the sticking point, they would actually consider me a friend. You know, the one moved away after just a couple months of our friendship and she still checks in with me now and again. My other closer, close German friend was actually my former German teacher who we became tandem partners. With the, she was practicing her English. I practiced my German. And then that morphed into a friendship. That was also an interesting way to make a friend. And with her too, I think we're not the kind of friends where I I feel like we're going to hang out every weekend. We actually really only meet up maybe once a month or so. But I do, from her, also still get the feeling that I'm a part of her life and that she considers me someone who who matters. Um, So I haven't had the experience where I have like a really close German friend and, and how that changes over time. But from having these people who I would consider more distant friends, those distant friendships I've had similar ones in America. And when you move away or circumstances change, sometimes you drift apart. And whenever you end up in the same place, you're good again, but it's, you don't really do much with it in between. Whereas these friendships here that are on that same level, there is sort of a stronger feeling that they think of me and care for me. For me, for me about that second part is uh, that once you're, once you make friends with them, you're friends for life. It is in a way but I think it's not any different to friendships anywhere else. Like when you, when you reach a level of friendship with anyone, you have a connection where you're willing to, like you say, check in with people that you haven't seen for five years or, or uh, if you live in the same city, you see each other kind of regularly and and so on. So I think it's the same in, in some ways, once you reach that point, it's not that there's anything different about being friends with a German for me. It's just that it's a lot harder to get to that point, which means that when a German opens up to you like that, it kind of means a lot more. So yeah, that's, I think I kind of don't fully confirm that second part, but I uh, think it, it does have more value because, because they're so difficult to get uh, to be friends with in the first place. I wonder too, if some of it comes back to how you identify or how you define the word friend. Right. Like I had people in my life when I lived in Chicago that I would have considered friends because we that was because we were spending a lot of time together or like connected in some way. But in the long term, would I really consider them the same kind of friend as, you know, when I use that word with people who I really I know we're going to be in each other's lives forever. Yeah. You know, to me, yeah. I use friend equally for both. And sometimes you throw in a best friend in there to help make the other one clearly superior, right? But I think for Germans, it seems more like they, they're they really hesitant to use that word. But once they do, they're serious about it. But I think you're, I mean, I see what you're saying, where it's like, well, a friend's a friend, like they're not going to not be around if you're really a friend. So maybe it has something to do with the definition. Yeah. I think that's also part of the culture clash is that the definition of people in their minds of what a friend, friend is, is different to what maybe the Germans define as, as friends and acquaintances. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we've, we have done a great job, Nicole, of uh, confirming or busting these myths. This is the last word in these cliches and stereotypes here on this podcast. <laughs> there is no other opinion that can be ended to. No, I'm kidding. The, uh, <laughs> I would love to hear from other people, their takes on these uh, myths that we've discussed. Nicole, where can people find you and your podcast? They can find my podcast wherever they're listening to this podcast. Just search for the Expat Cast in your podcast app of choice, and it should pop right on up. It's the nice little logo with the bike. Um, you can also find us on Instagram and on Twitter at the Expat Cast. And I always like to also share my email address, which is the at gmail.com, um, because I think it's fun to have random conversations with other fellow expats or in people interested in expatty things. So that all of those options are open for you to find more of me. 
Thanks, Nicole, for taking the time to come on the show. I really appreciate it, even though you're a rival. It's been great fun chatting to you and uh, discussing these myths and stereotypes about Germany. It was such a blast. Thank you for having me on. It was really fun to look at the German culture in this way with this, you know, two years in perspective. So thanks for the opportunity and uh, thanks for your show too. No, I shouldn't say that because we're rivals. No, but um, actually I think your show is really great. And I just want to thank you for all the hard work that you put into it every week um, so that listeners like me, because I'm also a fan, um, can enjoy it. So thanks to you. <laughs> Aww. That's nice. <laughs> Okay, Nicole, thanks for coming on. We'll, we'll chat again sometime. Bye-bye. So what a fun discussion with Nicole. And check out her podcast, The Expat Cast, wherever you listen to podcasts. And I would love to hear your thoughts on some of the cliches and stereotypes and tropes that we discussed about Germans. And what are your thoughts? We'd be interested to know, does this apply only to the southern states where Nicole and I are, Baden-Württemberg and Bavaria, or is it like this also in northern Germany? So join the Expat Life Germany Facebook group. We can discuss it there. Or you can email me at expatlifegermany at gmail.com. Or you can get on Twitter and tweet or comment on the Instagram post. You can find me on Instagram at Expat Life Germany, on Twitter at Expat Life DE, and expatlifegermany.de is the official website. Links in the show notes to all of those places. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this discussion. And that's it. Until next week, auf Wiederhören.